the summer of 2011, I came to India to better understand the microfinance industry. I met with executives from NGOs, for-profit microfinance institutions, and regulatory agencies, spoke to government officials and bankers, and listened to the stories of people who have taken loans in cities and villages. While I spent my time as an intern at Basics BSFL, a Hyderabad-based MFI, the following story is my own, and an attempt to capture what happened during the MFI boom, the ensuing crisis in Andhra Pradesh, and the possible global implications from what happened in India. This is what I found. In 1975, a small percentage of Indians held formal bank accounts. Few people had access to credit and were forced to take loans from money lenders at high interest rates, averaging 36 to 120 percent per annum. Oftentimes, lenders would take family jewelry as collateral and even threaten with violence if loans were not paid on time. The situation continues today throughout both urban and rural India, as only 60% of Indian adults have bank accounts, and many have no other choice but to take loans from money lenders. In 1976, Bangladeshi professor Muhammad Yunus and his colleague Akhtar Hamid Khan first experimented with the idea of microcredit. 42 furniture makers from a small Bangladeshi village were given $27 to purchase their materials. 25 years later, microcredit remains as one of many important initiatives of global poverty reduction. Early pioneers in India experimented with new financial models targeted at women and others who traditionally didn't have access to credit due to their location or a lack of documented credit history. In the mid-1970s, the Self-Employed Women's Association, or SEVA, offered small loans through their cooperative. Later on, through the efforts of rural communities, NGOs, and the Indian government, grants began funding self-help groups, or SHGs, usually between 15 to 20 women. Joint liability groups, JLGs, smaller units including both women and men, like SHGs, use social standing and group pressure to ensure repayments, with the threat of losing access to future loans as an incentive, thus mitigating the risk of defaults for lenders. In 1992, the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, or NABARD, strengthened the SHG movement throughout India with the creation of the SHG Bank Linkage Program, which substantially increased in size from the year 2000 onwards. SHGs continue today and account for a large percentage of microfinance loans in AP and throughout India. The model's underlying strength lies in the social changes realized through the group experience. Millions more women are making independent financial decisions new leadership has emerged, and rural communities have grown in strength. Social changes have been significant, but the SHG model's claims of promoting financial inclusion have been overstated. Even if the SHGs are compliant with the savings and meeting requirements, the maximum loan is small, usually split between a few group members, and is not immediately available due to the complicated delivery chain. Farmers and entrepreneurs who often need funds immediately can take loans from the group's own savings account, but the amount is almost never sufficient enough for the large-scale investment needs of agriculture and businesses. Despite the 4 million SHGs operating in India and over 12 million members of Andhra Pradesh alone, a huge demand for credit remained throughout the country from both women and men. Many of India's unbanked saw the benefits of the JLG model used by MFIs over the government-run SHG model and the local money lenders since MFIs provided them with quick access to larger amounts of credit, doorstep transactions, and diverse financial packages. However, not many MFIs offered farmers the loan amounts necessary to buy materials in bulk, with repayments following the harvest season, more in line with the farmers' cash flows. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, some NGOs converted into non-banking financial companies, or NBFCs, while a select few began as for-profit ventures from their foundation. The number of active borrowers mushroomed in the late 2000s, and the microfinance industry started to gain recognition in India's financial sector. By October of 2010, the top 10 MFIs alone held a cumulative gross loan portfolio of nearly $5 billion. But it wasn't that simple, and as the industry grew, complications emerged. Some MFIs were eager to gain larger market shares and projected annual growth rates of 200 to 300%. Some MFI employees, 
incentivized to increase the customer base, often provided loans to customers with insufficient monthly earnings to repay. And this was in spite of the fact that MFIs knew that the majority of microfinance borrowers who have the means to repay are not among the bottom 20% of income earners in the country. In other examples, three or four different MFIs provided multiple loans to a single borrower, sometimes for non-income generating activities, placing some into an unending cycle of debt. Some microfinance customers spent the loans on items different from what they told MFIs, like appliances and even dowry for weddings, while other customers weren't earning or saving enough from their monthly income to make repayments. Credit risk became a big problem. Each MFI had its own database of credit history, making it difficult to assess risk. Some customers even inflated their monthly income figures, hoping to access larger loans than they were likely able to pay back. Measures have been taken to better assess monthly income, but accuracy and accountability remain as serious challenges. And so even amidst a 97% repayment rate throughout India, problems persisted. And in late 2010, an alarming number of suicides in Andhra Pradesh were reportedly linked to MFIs. A strikingly similar scenario occurred just four years earlier in the Krishna district of Andhra Pradesh, but the MFI sector did not make adequate efforts to curb bad practices. A comprehensive set of provisions in 2007 aimed to regulate MFIs, but like most other bills, failed to get through the parliamentary process. In investigating the AP suicides of 2010, Separate reports released by both the government and microfinance industry clearly demonstrate a relation between customers accessing MFI loans and suicides reported in the media. But the full story is a bit more complicated. Over the past decade, suicides in India have gradually increased due to higher social pressure associated with economic growth. This has occurred throughout developing contexts. During the 2010 AP crisis, Men made up the majority of microfinance borrowers who took their own lives, and researchers point to the lack of social support and pressures from changing gender roles as reasons for an increase in male suicides. However, despite increasing social and economic pressure, it is clear that in a statistically significant number of cases, multiple lending and the coercive practices of MFI field personnel collecting repayments were responsible for a portion of these tragedies. Fiji Mahajan, speaking as the chairman of the Microfinance Institution Network, or MFIN. Even if one suicide is linked to microfinance institutions who are MFIN members, we will atone for it. And then the media frenzy began. Well, India is facing a microcredit crisis. The booming industry was supposed to help India's poor climb out of poverty. Now it's on the verge of collapse in one of the nation's largest provinces. Officials blame greedy lenders for forcing them to take dramatic action. It seems as if the whole world is crashing upon the microfinance sector. Protesters on the streets literally paying for blood. Even the business model of microfinance is under scrutiny as it is being held responsible for ruining simple village lives. Using abusive language and putting peer pressure are not uncommon. People went on to streets demonstrating against the microfinance institutions. And the hero had turned into a villain in just a matter of months. And like clockwork, political opportunism followed, with various parties and personalities vying for a larger section of the perceived vote bank. We have to act and we will lie. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not relevant as to how many people have committed suicide. The fact is that there are several cases of suicides. Amidst the media hysteria, the AP government correctly highlighted some of the shortfalls of current microfinance regulations, but their actions were counterproductive to the financial inclusion they claimed to be fighting for. The real intention was to shut down the entire sector. On October 14, 2010, an ordinance was put into place requiring MFIs to submit every loan application to the urban or rural branch in one of 24 district-level offices for approval. Even the central government could not process the sheer volume of loans, averaging over 1,000 applications daily. The ordinance effectively stopped all MFI operations in AP, and its passage as a bill a few months later was the nail in the coffin. And they did that because there were more and more reports that microcredit was being linked to suicides. People were getting so trapped by debt they were killing themselves. How true those reports are is a whole other question, but that became a kind of political dynamic that drove the government to intervene in a very draconian way, really. I think they overreacted. 
It's unquestionable that a select few engage in appalling practices, harassing borrowers and collecting additional revenue through complicated fees that the average borrower was unable to understand. Chastising companies is one thing, but some politicians went a few steps too far, calling on borrowers not to repay MFI loans. Now, in an unprecedented move, the local government is telling thousands of villagers not to pay MFIs back. What followed was severe and had implications well beyond MFIs and the state of AP. While uh, lenders should be responsible, the borrower should also be responsible for repayment. And unless repayment happens, uh, the whole cycle will fail. And fail, it did. Now, Vijay Mahajan, the president of, uh, the, uh, of MFIN, uh, in, in fact, clearly stated that their uh, collections, the repayments had come down drastically from 90% to just 20% over the last 45 days alone. So this is the extent to which uh, this ordinance has hampered their operations in Andhra Pradesh. You know, we are using the repayments from other states to, uh, to repay banks. I'm very happy to say that no MFI has so far uh, held back a single payment that, that was due from us to banks, but that is at the cost of not disbursing in uh, states like Bihar and Chhattisgarh and Orissa and so forth. Microfinance institutions will certainly be hit, but I want to draw the attention to the fact that most of our money is from the banking system, so it will be hit. With almost one-fourth of all MFI loans in AP and a default rate of 85 to 90 percent, over $1.7 billion worth of loans remained unpaid in the state. A great degree of uncertainty consumed the sector, and banks stopped lending to MFIs. The machine that drove the entire system and allowed MFIs to loan to customers and expand operations in difficult-to-reach areas grinded to a complete halt. An old Lucknow story tells the tale of two men displaying such courtesy boarding a train that it leaves the station without either. The Hyderabad version features a banker or lender ambivalent to inject capital into MFIs without more equity investment, a vote of confidence in the firm. In the summer of 2011, the MFI train is dangerously approaching illiquidity, with some smaller MFIs closing up shop in India altogether. But more importantly, more than one crore poor households in Andhra Pradesh will cease to get any credit from any formal institution in the near future. So what happens to the borrower if they don't repay? With new credit information being compiled, microfinance borrowers with an outstanding portfolio may find it difficult to receive any future loans. MFIs are losing out, of course, but in the end, the educated and top management working for these companies are likely to find other opportunities. It's the borrower, told not to repay by political leaders, who will lose out the most. If MFIs are unable to operate because of a shortage of funds, not only will existing customers not have access, but potential customers, only reachable through scale, will have access to credit only through money lenders or government programs that may develop. We've achieved a number of things. We've achieved stability, uh, we've achieved control, but the one thing we've not achieved is inclusion. If a large injection of capital and market certainty do not surface in the immediate future, millions of microfinance borrowers are likely to lose access to immediate credit at 25% or lower. Money lenders are likely to take over the lost customer base of MFIs, and the overwhelming majority of India's approximately 100 or so for-profit MFIs will dwindle to 10 large MFIs through mergers and acquisitions and bank takeovers. The industry is likely to lose much of its capacity to innovate new products, and customers will have a smaller selection of models to choose from. Many existing customers will not be able to access future credit, and other key services such as insurance, business development, and vocational training. Most importantly, the poorest regions of India, Jharkhand, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, and the Northeast, will remain financially excluded until the MFI sector can recover its losses and expand to these low-density areas, or government-initiated smart subsidies surface soon. Banks have yet to step up to the plate in a significant way, and the future rests upon their decisions to fund MFIs or reach customers themselves, the real future of financial inclusion in India. What's the, what's the worst case scenario here? The worst case scenario? Uh, the worst case scenario is that microcredit in India is pretty much bankrupted. 
uh, because um, the state that we're talking about, Andhra Pradesh, is the biggest state for microcredit. And if it completely falls apart, that could destroy these, these, the finances of these microcreditors. Uh, that in turn means that poor people will have less, fewer options when they need to borrow in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, it could also send ripple effects around the world and really damage the entire global, the entire uh, microfinance industry um, and having the same effects in other countries. The fallout from the AP crisis has reached beyond India, and the perceived risk may affect policy and investment decisions related to microfinance throughout the world. If an Indian loses access to microfinance, they may at least have access to money lender or the occasional small loan from a local bank. But there are regions in some countries where people do not have alternative sources of credit other than microfinance, and its closure may eliminate the only type of credit available to people within hundreds of kilometers. In the end, as most crises and disasters go, the poorest will lose out most, a concentrated few will benefit, and it will be back to the drawing boards for those that are serious about financial inclusion in India. This has been a credit story, and credit story only, but it's important to point out that a slim few realized that access to credit was only one piece of the puzzle, and that other financial products and services are needed to truly empower individuals. It's up to policymakers regulators, bankers, private investors, MFIs, and NGOs to work in tandem to offer a comprehensive set of options for working families that are struggling to meet their monthly needs. It's time for all of the important players to take responsibility and bring about a society that they speak of. What we need is less talk and more walk. Shini, tomar radha gije thake na. Shono go ayan dada, tomar shri moti radha. Jatulo mana char bi char kichu iragle na. Jatulo man pa char bi char kichu iragle na. In the summer of 2011, I came to India to better understand the microfinance industry. I met with executives from NGOs, for-profit microfinance institutions, and regulatory agencies, spoke to government officials and bankers, and listened to the stories of people who have taken loans in cities and villages. While I spent my time as an intern at Basics BSFL, a Hyderabad-based MFI, the following story is my own, and an attempt to capture what happened during the MFI boom thus mitigating the risk of defaults for lenders. In 1992, the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, or NABARD, 
strengthened the SHG movement throughout India with the creation of the SHG Bank Linkage Program, which substantially increased in size from the year 2000 onwards. SHGs continue today and account for a large percentage of microfinance loans in AP and throughout India. The model's underlying strength lies in the social changes realized through the group experience. Millions more women are making independent financial decisions, new the ensuing crisis in Andhra Pradesh, and the possible global implications from what happened in India. This is what I found. In 1975, a small percentage of Indians held formal bank accounts. Few people had access to credit and were forced to take loans from money lenders at high interest rates, averaging 36 to 120 percent per annum. Oftentimes, lenders would take family jewelry as collateral and even threaten with violence if loans were not paid on time. The situation continues today throughout both urban and rural India, as only 60% of Indian adults lack of documented credit history. In the mid-1970s, the Self-Employed Women's Association, or SEVA, offered small loans through their cooperative. Later on, through the efforts of rural communities, NGOs, and the Indian government, grants began funding self-help groups, or SHGs, usually between 15 to 20 women. Joint liability groups, JLGs, smaller units including both women and men, like SHGs, use social standing and group pressure to ensure repayments, with the threat of losing access to future loans as an incentive of bank accounts, and many have no other choice but to take loans from money lenders. In 1976, Bangladeshi professor Muhammad Yunus and his colleague Akhtar Hamid Khan first experimented with the idea of microcredit. 42 furniture makers from a small Bangladeshi village were given $27 to purchase their materials. 25 years later, microcredit remains as one of many important initiatives of global poverty reduction. Early pioneers in India experimented with new financial models targeted at women and others who traditionally didn't have access to credit due to their location or a 